This morning we are marking 20 years since the September 11 tax on this country. This picture captures the moment President George W. Bush was informed that America was under attack. His chief of staff, Andy Card, interrupted the president's visit at an elementary school classroom in Florida to tell him a second plane had crashed into the Twin Towers in New York. And Andy Card joins us now along with former Secretary of Homeland Security under President Obama, Jay Johnson. Gentlemen, good morning. It's great to have you with us. Great to be with you. Uh, let me start with you, Andy. What is it like to be sitting here now almost 20 years later? I said at the top of the show, it never gets any less powerful to be here to look down into that. Literally moment. 20 years ago was the last day that America, people woke up with no fear. September 11th, 2001, did what the terrorists wanted to do, which fear is their ally. Fear is their mode of operation. They attacked us to try to have us be so afraid that we would collapse. Instead, it was a unifying moment. Very, very sad. But America had all of its people giving up their labels of the past. Republicans and Democrats, they said they were American. We said we will not let fear drive the way we do our business. And so it changed the world, it changed America. But September 10th, 2001, was a day when we woke up happy, no fear, went to work. Some people were getting ready to take trips from Boston to Los Angeles or from Newark and for Dallas Airport, and everything changed on September 11th. And the message I delivered to the president that day, I knew was a historic message. I didn't want to have to deliver it. He certainly did not want to hear it. You said that that was to be an easy day for the president. In the life of a president, it was. He was, gonna, he was doing reading exercises with second graders in Sarasota, Florida. Take us through a little bit, if you can, what happened. You were you informed that a plane, when he went into the room, had hit the first building, the first reports, and we all remember it was that it was a small plane. We couldn't have imagined what it was going to be. What happened from there? I was standing at the door to the classroom. The principal and the president had already gone into the classroom with the president believing that a small twin-engine prop plane hit one of the towers at the World Trade Center in New York City. When the door shut after the principal and the president walked into the classroom, I'm standing there and a Navy captain, Deb Lauer, the, from the Situation Room, came up to me and said, sir, it appears it was not a small twin-engine prop plane, it was a commercial jetliner. I thought about the fear the passengers on the plane must have had. I don't know why that's where my mind went, but that's where it went. That was a nanosecond because Captain Lauer came up to me and said, oh my God, another plane hit the other tower at the World Trade Center. I knew that it was not an accident. I knew it wasn't a coincidence. I knew that it was an organized attack. I actually reflected on the initials UBL, Osama bin Laden, and I knew about Al-Qaeda. I knew about the attacks on the World Trade Center in early 1993, and I decided to pass on to the president two facts, make one editorial comment, and to do nothing to invite a conversation with him. I knew he was in front of second graders, in front of a press pool. I presumed there would be a boom microphone over him, and I didn't want to have a conversation with him. I stepped into the room. I thought about what I would say, and when the students were told to take out their books to read with the president, that's when I went up to the president, leaned over and whispered into his right ear, a second plane hit the second tower. America is under attack. I believe that my words then caused the president to reflect on his job. No longer was <clears throat> the presidency about his agenda. It was about the oath of office that he took to preserve, protect, and defend. And I was very impressed how he reacted when I told him he did nothing to introduce fear to those young second graders. He didn't do anything to demonstrate fear to the media that would have translated it to the satisfaction of the terrorists. So I was very impressed with how he reacted. He also stayed there long enough for me to get things ready for him when he walked back into that holding room. And then he made the public remarks only after he'd finished with those kids. Secretary Johnson, you had worked in the government, working for a law firm up in Midtown on September 11th, 2001. What was your reaction when you heard the news? Again, it's not something most of us could have conceived of. It didn't seem possible that a commercial airline had hit these buildings. I was one of those Americans in private life that Andy spoke of that morning. 9-11 happens to be my birthday. And I remember vividly, I drove in from our home in New Jersey out here. The weather was a lot like it is right now, a crisp, beautiful blue sky day, got to work early in midtown Manhattan, same law firm I'm with now. I was sitting at my desk and I heard somebody next door to me say, a small plane has hit the World Trade Center. 
And from my office, I had a view down 6th Avenue at this site right here. I could see it, and I thought to myself, that's not a small airplane. And uh, the moment I'll never forget was watching the first tower collapse because it had been, as you know, Willie, a permanent fixture on the New York City skyline for so long. I took family there to Windows on the World, and my son was three weeks old. I took him up to the observation deck in 1994, and to see that tower collapse was incomprehensible, and it changed me, it changed our nation. Uh, the Department of Homeland Security didn't exist on 2001. Um, and here we are 20 years later. We've built back bigger. Uh, I'm proud to say I'm a trustee of this memorial here today. And I think it's important that we learn the lessons of the past and honor the bravery and the suffering of those who, who died that day. You, as you said, ran this newly formed Homeland Security Department under President Obama. Um, the threat matrix is something we hear about a lot. And we've been talking this morning about how the American military went to Afghanistan, prevented further attacks for 20 years on our soil, which on September 11th, anything was possible. We assumed we were going to be attacked again and perhaps soon. What was that daily job look like? What did it look like for you to sit down and have a spreadsheet in front of you of what the world looked like, of what the threats were? As I saw the job, the cornerstone of our mission was counterterrorism. It was the reason DHS was formed, and so that was my principal focus. But in the course of the Secretary's day, you're concerned about terrorism, you're concerned about aviation security, cyber security, maritime security, the Coast Guard, Andy was Secretary of Transportation when the Coast Guard was with him, pre-9-11. Um, immigration, of course, um, and just a whole range of things. And I think it's important that one cabinet-level person have eyes and ears on all those, those different threats. But terrorism and the threat of terrorism was my principal concern. And the threat of terrorism has evolved greatly since 9-11. Since Guys, Joe has a question for you. Joe? Andy, I want to start with you. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, so many tense moments on that day. I saw the Apple uh, TV documentary uh, where you, you talked about, and others talked about what was going on in Air Force One. Uh, the pilot, uh, after uh, the second uh, plane uh, hit, uh, putting an armed guard outside the cockpit door because he didn't know if it was an inside job, if somebody on 9-11 uh, or somebody on the plane uh, could have crashed through the doors, but also uh, extraordinary moments where you had to confront President Bush, who understandably wanted to get back to the White House, wanted to get back to Washington, D.C., didn't want anybody to think that he was running away from anything. But you and the Secret Service had to deliver the message, Mr. President, it's not safe yet. Can you talk about those extraordinarily tense moments and how difficult it was for you to have to tell our president, you're not going to get your way here. The Secret Service isn't going to give your way. This is their plane. I remember very well the president said, we're going right back to Washington, D.C. I can't wait to get to the White House. And I said, Mr. President, I don't think you want to make that decision right now. I went up and spoke to the pilot of Air Force One, and Mark Tillman said, I, I'm not going to land at Andrews Air Force Base unless I know it's safe to land there. <laughs> the Secret Service said, <clears throat> excuse me, that they were not going to allow the president to go in a motorcade or be in a helicopter over the city without knowing that it would be safe. So I kept talking to the pilot, to the Secret Service. The president really was arguing with me, and I wrestled in my mind, is he saying that as president or as commander-in-chief? And I decided he was saying it as president. He kind of wanted the image of him being back in the White House, but I knew he had to have the tools to meet the responsibilities as commander-in-chief and protect the country. So we went to Barksdale Air Force Base first. We trimmed down the number of people in Air Force One. And he called back to the folks in Washington, D.C. He 
recorded a message for the American people that was released as soon as we took off from Barksdale Air Force Base. We went to Strategic Air Command, where we had tremendously good communications with all aspects of our government. And then he turned to me and said, can we go back to Washington, D.C.? Now, I checked with the Air Force. I checked with the Secret Service. The Secret Service was acquiescing. I'm not sure that they were enthusiastic, but they acquiesced. And we did fly back to Washington, D.C. We landed, and I'll never forget the sight of, first of all, the fighter jets protecting Air Force One was so close we could see the faces of the pilots. But then you could see the po smoke billowing out of the Pentagon. And the president said, that's the face of war in the 21st century. We landed, we jumped into a helicopter, became Marine One. We flew down to the Potomac, hugged the river, and then popped up behind the uh, Lincoln Memorial, went down the ball, took a left, and landed on the South Lawn and went into the Oval Office, which was getting ready for the president to address the nation. He then went into the dining room off the Oval Office, worked on a speech, and in, at 8.30 that night, he delivered a very short but significant address, not only to the American people, to the world, because he said to every world leader, if you harbor terrorists, you're just as guilty as the terrorists. Basically, you're either with us or against us. Hey, thanks so much for watching our YouTube channel. You can follow up on today's top stories and breaking news or catch up on your favorite MSNBC shows all in one place. Download the NBC News app today.